Hey everyone, welcome back to Wiki University, the podcast that dives down the rabbit hole of Wikipedia in an effort to explore the sum of all human knowledge. I am your professor, Kyle Berseth, and as always, I am joined by WikiU's number one student, Jason Nunez. And don't forget, head of the stupidity department. Oh yeah, you got a recent promotion last semester. We're back for winter Take semester. Up. Oh, I think you said winner. Like winner take all. Well, we haven't really. So you say winner, not winter. Winner. I took winner. Yeah, I, just I took multiple slur it all ESL classes. Winter. So it was really beaten into me that I have to say winter. Win. Wait, you say beaten? I say beaten. <laughs> that was also beaten into me. It's winter time, and you know that's time for beaten. <laughs> And it gets chilly. Some nothing, nothing uh, gets you gets a <laughs> yeah. body warmer than a good beaten. <laughs> a good beaten. Beat. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, welcome to this new year, new me, new head of stupidity department. New you? No, same head. No, different head. Because same head. You no, know, if I'm a new me, oh. that means a new head of the stupidity department, which is me again, still. Okay. But it's a new me. Well, I feel dumber. Already. You're welcome. <laughs> I don't think we've actually established, Jason, whether WikiU does a winter session or just goes right into the spring semester. Uh, some schools, they have like a one month winter session where you can take like a single class and then they go into spring semester. I've been coming here for 364 days. The only day I take off, Columbus Day. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Why is that? Because uh, I'm a big fan of America. Okay. Anyway, uh, Jason, I'm fresh off the boat from Costa Rica. That's why I still got my tropical wear on. Are you on Costa Rica time still? Yeah. It's two hours in a, the other direction. The, what direction is that? Uh, towards the East Coast. Oh, okay. Towards Costa Rica. Towards the... Towards the Atlantic. Where, where is Costa Rica? Is it next to Puerto Rico or Puerto Rica? Well, I was in... Costa Rica, so I didn't look at other places, but it's in Central America. It's next to Panama. Oh, I was way off. I figured it's like next to Florida. Well, in, all, mean, in all earnest, I thought I guess it was it's like not so far from Florida, but I mean it's closer to Florida than we. No, it's probably closer to us, right? Mm, I bet it's closer to Florida than. You said Central America, though. Right? Central America. How is that closer to Florida? Closer to Florida than than we what? are. Than, than us to Costa Rica. I feel like we're closer to Costa Rica. Well, Florida's got that long tip. Okay. You know, that's a, that makes it really close. I suppose. So how, were, how was the food? Tell me about the food. The food, very similar to Hawaii in that there was a lot of fresh fruit. Okay, great. Other than that, a little redundant. So something we did was a bunch of, like, typical touristy co Costa Rican things. Which, you know, includes like zip lining through the jungle or a That's guided cool. hike through the jungle or a guided boat tour or something through like that. The jungle. Through the jungle. A lot of jungle themes. A lot of jungle. Lot of jungle. <laughs> There's a lot of plant life. Okay, cool. But at the end of every tour, they were like, and then you'll have a traditional Costa Rican meal. And every time it was chicken and rice, yeah. which is their traditional meal. So it felt a little redundant by like the seventh day. I th I think uh, chicken and rice is a lot of Latin America's traditional meal. Mm, yeah, I could see that. Yeah, I mean it was good. So then, Don't why all the wrong. complaints? I like chicken and rice, but it was a lot of chicken and rice. Yeah, was it like did they change it up a little bit, like a little, a little Costa bit. Rican fried uh, chicken and mm. rice? Did they have Korean barbecue chicken and rice? No, that would now we're talking. If and then just get rid of the chicken and rice and make it all Korean barbecue, then. For money. Ooh, we should open <laughs> up our own Korean barbecue place in Costa Rica. We'll I think make it thousands. Do well. I think it would do well. At least thousands. Easily we would lose thousands, thousands too. But <laughs> Oh, we would lose more than that. And I guarantee it. But folks, thank you guys for coming. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys for joining us again on a new episode, a new year. Thank you for liking and subscribing and just a friendly reminder to tell a friend and or comment on whenever, wherever you're listening to this podcast. Do one or all of those things. Now, Jason, 
Did you bring a topic to school today, or am I starting? I left in the East Coast. <laughs> you left the yeah. topic in the East Coast. Well, yeah, I checked the bag when I was coming back. You were on the East Coast. You I didn't was, mention I, that. I was on the East Coast uh, visiting home, and then on my what way back. What was the food like there? The food? Yeah. Oh, very traditional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Chicken and rice. Chicken and rice. <laughs> wow. But mine was g- green rice, Peruvian green rice. I'm sorry, what? It's green. Our rice is green. It doesn't always have to be white. No, take it back. I've heard of brown. No, I don't like white. it white. White is not right. We've green, it's not easy being green, but it sure is delicious. We've covered rice on the podcast. I've been covered in rice before I on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Every time Jason goes to the beach, he insists on being buried in rice. I only you, I usually just attend weddings for the rice. <laughs> I haven't been to a wedding <laughs> where anyone throws rice. Can't wait till my You're I just jumping ordered, in a time machine and yeah. going to 1950s weddings. I ordered an 18. I ordered a dump truck of uh, <laughs> rice for my wedding coming up. Don't miss it. I just had this image of someone not understanding the tradition <laughs> of throwing rice, and they go to Costco and get like a 50 pound bag of rice and throw the whole bag. Like they don't realize that you're supposed to take it out of the bag. Oh, I got. And they l- murder the groom. I have BB guns ready for people <laughs> to put the rice in and just start shooting us once we wed. Yeah, that would yeah. take it up a notch. Once we consummate. Not you and me. <laughs> it no, sounds no. like you're talking yeah. about you and me. Yeah, yeah. I am. <laughs> Once we consummate. <laughs> okay. Well, I brought a topic. Oh, sweet. I didn't. I left in the East Coast as we just went over. Yes. Yeah. As you may have noticed, we're back in Los Angeles, both of us. Beautiful, sunny Los Angeles, New Got, Mexico. But it's been Mexico. miserable weather here lately. Yeah, today was just the first day of a little bit of sun. It's been so dreary. Dreary. It reminded me a little Wait, bit of- Wait, do you uh, say dreary? Dreary, yeah. It was my <laughs> ESO class. They beat it into me. This winter's been dreary. Yeah, dreary. Um, it was a, what is it, what is it called? An unpleasant surprise. Flying in here from the East Coast to just find a a cesspool of water and <laughs> oh, <Chris. laughs> it's just pouring rain down here, which I'm not used to, and I'm sure these Los Angelos uh, aren't used to this as well. So. Yeah, give me back my mega drought. I have to say though, post mega, I mean post uh, rainfall, mega rainfall, mega rainfall. It is very refreshing to see such bright and beautiful greenery all around. And I'm not talking about the THC. I'm talking about the pure God's green earth greenery coming out from these, like what I used to look at as just little sand pits. Sand pits? You mean the hills? Yeah, yeah. The pit is a hole. What okay, hole well, it was just, been? it was all like sandy and be- it was like dirt. It was no. I didn't see any forest, any greenery. Mm. Any it was in there. It just yeah. needed a little water. Yeah, just who knew? Just a couple just of squirts <laughs> from just, just, just a couple of squirts feet from of God. Water yeah, in one day. I think the rain took care of us in terms of the drought. There's more rain coming later on this week. I know it's or miserable. So, well, something I found out is the rainfall that we've been having. This big storm. Yeah. Yeah. Is called a pineapple express. Is it really? Why? I don't know. I, that's my topic today. We're going to learn about it. What came first, the movie, the drug, or the weather? What is the drug, Pineapple Express? Is that a well, I guess, no, type I, of weed? I, I guess, yes, but I suppose that came after the movie. I tried to watch that movie. Not my favorite. It's pretty fun. Really? It's actually pretty fun. Okay, so do you want to dive in here? Let's do it. I'm excited about this one. I want to know more about the Pineapple Express. Or is it the Pineapple Limited? No, it's the Pineapple Express. It's only stopping here and there. Just there? You know, like a local train versus an express train. We can go in a big... Uh, Sounds like you don't know. Pineapple yeah, that's what express. I mean. We can <laughs> dive in and deep in with that. <laughs> well, we can go to that next. Sweet. Pineapple Express is a non-technical term for a meteorolo- meteorology. Ooh, tough start to the year. Meteorological phenomenon. M- meteorological? No. I just nailed it. Okay. A specific recurring atmospheric river characterized by a strong and persistent large-scale flow of warm, moist mm. air and the associated heavy precipitation both in the waters immediately northeast of the Hawaiian Islands and extending northeast to any location along the Pacific coast of North America. A Pineapple Express is an example of an atmospheric river, which is a more general term 
for such relatively narrow corridors of enhanced water vapor transport at mid-latitudes around the world. So it sounds like an atmospheric river is kind of like a river in the sky. In the sky of, of water molecules rather than like... Yeah. Whoa. Well, not water molecules, also... Well, water, right? Full on water, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you know, you say river, and it's like you see, you see mm. the because if you look up, yeah, there's no rocks, there's and no fish, there's <laughs> no s- salmon, salmon swimming this upstream. Sounds like a, an episode, or not an episode, a level on like Super Mario Three or something. Right, right. We have to catch some. Flying you gotta fish. jump on the salmon. They're going against the left to right movement, and then you gotta fall through the clouds. That'd be a fun one. So now the Pineapple Express, is that a specific river or a specific thing that always comes from the Hawaii Hawaii? Or is yeah, it is I, it or can that be is that an expression for that type of thing? Like can that happen somewhere else in southern uh, the southern hemisphere where uh, where the the water molecules or vapor, I guess it's called, is traveling water. in a sort of a river. Yeah. It sounds like it is an atmospheric river specifically the one that goes from Hawaii to the West Coast, West Coast okay. of the U.S., they named the Pineapple Express. So I'm guessing in other parts of the world you can have an atmospheric river, but this is our atmospheric river. Ours, not yours. You hear that? I'm guessing it's pineapple because it's like Hawaiian-themed, right? Right, yeah. right. Not because they're swingers. I'm sorry, are swingers known for pineapple? Yeah, they love f- pineapples. You didn't know that? Wait, they f- the pineapples <laughs> that too yeah a pineapple express is driven by a strong southern branch of the polar jet stream and is marked by the presence of a surface frontal boundary which is typically either slow or stationary with waves of low pressure traveling along its length each of these low pressure systems brings enhanced rainfall the conditions are often created by the madden julian oscillation an equatorial rainfall pattern, which feeds its moisture into this pattern. They are also present during an El Nino episode. Yeah, I love it when you talk dirty, man. <laughs> this, this is our Pineapple Express episode, not the El Nino episode. I'm very... So what about El Nino? What does it do? El Nino? I don't know what El Nino is. Why did it mention, why did it, mention it? Well, they are present at the same time as El Nino. So if you get an El Nino and a Pineapple Express, you're looking... At some heavy rainfall, I believe. But it, an El Nino, I believe, is a Nino on the East Coast, right? Or there's no El, El there's Nino Ninos is here? on the West Coast. Yeah, yeah, what? the Ninos migrated west. But I always heard of El Nino. I thought that was something that happened in the East Coast in from the Florida. 90s. Yeah, El Nino, I feel like made its first splash in the 90s, and then Chris Farley did like, a bit like on Elian SNL. Gonzalez. You know, they're in the same range. Is he on the West Coast, too, now? He also splashed. Yeah. Um, I don't know where Elion is. After that, after this, do you want to go to Elion Gonzalez? Yeah, just to <laughs> see where his whereabouts are. Okay. The combination of moisture-laden air, atmospheric dynamics, and orographic enhancement resulting from the passage of this air over the mountain ranges of the western coast of North America causes some of the most torrential rains to occur in the region. Whoa. Pineapple Express systems typically generate heavy snowfall in the mountains and interior plateau, which which often melts rapidly because of the warming effect of the system. So I guess you get snow, then you get warm air. After being drained of their moisture, the tropical air masses... Love being drained. Oh, I know. Big fan. Big, Mm. big fan. I used to go to Costa Rica sometimes just to get drained. Is that where you went? If I'm being honest, I can't keep up. I just like draining myself when I was asking you if that's w- that's the reason why you went to Costa Rica is for the draining. Yeah, it was a family trip. <laughs> yeah? Yep. We all, you know, the family <laughs> that drains together stays together. It doesn't rhyme, but trust me, it works. I think it does rhyme. The together <laughs> part is what rhymes. You can't rhyme together with together. <laughs> I guess it would be drains together, stains together. <laughs> There's going to be some staining when it comes to that much draining. If everyone's you, dra- you got 11 people draining. 
You're going to need a dry cleaner. Couple after being Go ahead. <laughs> after being drained of their moisture, the tropical air masses reach the inland prairies as a Chinook wind or simply What would you call me? A Chinook. Oh. A term which is also synonymous in the Pacific Northwest with the Pineapple Express. Mm. So we could continue on to Ooh, whoa. To extreme cases. Yeah, give me some extreme, like, uh, like, like, just full on draining. Full on extreme. Yeah. Yeah. Examples of this are the Christmas flood of 1964. We could go to that, see the body count. Let the bodies hit the flow. Let the bodies hit the flow. Yeah, all these kids nowadays are interested in body counts. You know, they should look up some disasters. <laughs> they, they, their body counts are compared, you know, are theirs. <laughs> ESL, huh? You took ESL? Are you sure? The Christmas flood of 1964 was a major flood in the United States, Pacific Northwest, and some of Northern California between December 18th, 1964, and January 7th, 1965. That's pretty long. That's a long, yep. Considered a 100-year flood, it is the worst flood in recorded history on nearly every major stream and river in coastal Northern California, and one of the worst to affect the Willamette river in oregon it also affected parts of southwest washington idaho and nevada in oregon 17 or 18 people died this sounds like a body counts nothing sounds like you talking about your body count i don't know anywhere from uh <laughs> three to uh, 25 yeah. <laughs> i forget it was but who's counting college was foggy <laughs> <laughs> As a result of the disaster, it caused hundreds of millions of dollars in damage. The National Weather Service rated the flood as the fifth most destructive weather event in Oregon in the 20th century. I wonder if the National Weather Service comes out with, like, online listicles, like the big, you won't believe how destructive these floods were. They showed off, you know, weather catastrophes, body counts. People want the body counts. People. If it bleeds, it leads. Now, this is interesting. The flood killed 19 people, this says. 18 or 19. I feel like maybe it was 18, and then, like, one died, like, three later? months later from, like, an infection from a cut they got during the flood. Or they, uh, or they drank too much flood water. Mm, I've been known to do hey that. Hey, man, around the holidays, you know. <laughs> yeah, get flooded. <laughs> Whoa, here's a picture. I kind of like older extreme events, I don't though. Do, I don't do pictures. It's okay. scary. Early in 1862, extreme storms riding the Pineapple Express battered the West Coast for 45 days. Wait, so a storm can ride this thing? Riding the Pineapple Express. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Whoa. So kind of like the storm, just like if it gets near, it kind of gets sucked in and then taken on that river route. Yeah, well, I think that's the part about combining with El Nino. So I think... All right, I'm going back to El Nino real quick because we got to learn something. Because maybe El Nino is just more heavy winds, and then that water gets in. Very heavy. Let's see. Heavy bottom or heavy or top heavy? Uh, El Nino, also known as the boy, the boy, is the warm phase of the El Nino Southern Oscillation and is associated with a band of warm ocean water that develops in the central and east central equatorial pacific including the area off the pacific coast of south america so it's actually pacific i don't know how the east coast got el ninoed in the 90s maybe I mean, it i'm came not across i'm not incorrect Mexico? right i'm not no because right? I, re I remember or was it such a big thing that like they taught it everywhere because it's a i don't know big weather ordeal El Nino is accompanied by high air pressure in the western pacific and low air pressure in the eastern pacific Hey, when they go high, we go low. El Nino phases are known to last close to four years. What? However, records demonstrate that the cycles have lasted between two and seven years. During the development of El Nino, rainfall develops between September and November. This isn't making sense for our situation. Perhaps our... Um, destruction of, of, of this planet is taking into full effect that now El Nino is coming up, you know, rear-ending us at the end of December. I'm going to go down to effects on the global climate here. 
oh, it affects the global climate. We're not affecting El Nino. It affects the global climate. Oh, okay. So it's like we're we're not like I'm not. You can't touch El Nino. Yeah, I'm not throwing trash into the street. Like the street is <laughs> taking my trash. Taking your trash. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then that goes down into the sewer system, which flows into the ocean. Right. And Which, then the ocean takes your then, trash. Yeah, and then the ocean evaporates And it. I have no more trash. And yeah. And then it feeds it into the Pineapple Express. Exactly. To keep those engines running. I'm here. <laughs> we need to run things on coal. <laughs> I thought it was trash. I thought it was running on trash. Yeah, coal, the new trash. El Nino affects the global climate and disrupts normal weather patterns which as a result can lead to intense storms in some places and droughts in others. So it isn't... It's a double-edged sword, Yeah, this, this Nino, this bad hombre. He's got to be a bad hombre by now, right? If he was... <laughs> <laughs> look, I'm just saying, if he was El Nino, like back when I was in middle school, he must be a bad hombre uh, now. They're not sending their best El Ninos, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They send their baddest of hombres <laughs> to the front lines. <laughs> okay, I'm back on Pineapple Express. Let's wrap it up here, this section, not the episode. Okay. I already wrapped we did up. the El Nino episode. Now we're back True. on the Pineapple Express episode. But you wanted to know about one more flood. This is 1862. It lasted 45 days. In addition to a sudden snowmelt, some places received an estimated 8.5 feet. Of rain. Whoa. 8.5 feet? 8.5 feet. That's I'd a be drowning. pool. Yeah, Me I'm too. drowning. I don't know. Well, no, uh, you're drowning. I'm, I'm swimming. Drowning. Yeah, I'm swimming. You can swim. I'm helping you. <laughs> yeah, I'm you can stand, you you can stand on my shoulder. You can yeah, be on my shoulders, and I'll drown. Thank you. While you thrive. Appreciate yeah. it. Hopefully, I, w- I could hold my breath long enough for you to like get gillies, get gills. Anyway, it led to the worst flood in recorded history of California, Oregon, and Nevada, known as the Great Flood of 1862. I'm briefly going to go to that to see the body count. Yeah, let me see them body counts. Now this, this is giving me different information. They say it lasts 43 days. Wikipedia is contra- uh, contradicting itself. And the event dumped an equivalent of 10 feet of water in California in the form of rain and snow. Okay, so. A little bit. Of, it's hard to gauge when you're trying to measure snow. It's melting at such a pace. Oh, my what goodness. What weighs more, 20 pounds of snow or 20 pounds of water? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, what does weigh more? 20 pounds of water versus 20 pounds <laughs> of snow. Snow's not as dense as water. Snow's not? Snow's not. Who said anything <laughs> about snow's not? What are, well, okay, 20 pounds of snow, 20 pounds of water. And you're not allowed to pee on the snow. Or 20 pounds of snow snot. Mm. Which weighs the most? Probably the snow snot. Probably. Okay, this was some flood, Jason. Okay, How, what kind of flood, Kyle? The storms caused approximately $100 million in damage, which is equivalent to 3.1 billion in today's money. Today's money. Whoa. The governor, state legislature, and state employees were not paid for a year and a half. They're just like, keep working. We're dealing with this flood. I've just I, figure well, it out. I would have quit such a long <laughs> yeah. time ago. I'm just like, I mean, that's beyond one, quiet quitting. I mean, it two just, paychecks, and I'd be like, yeah, this is not going to work out. Although, think about the person who stuck it out, and then he gets a lump sum of a of a, of like eighteen months. They worth. just give him a, a giant gold nugget <laughs> back then. That would be. I'll accept a gold nugget. I'll be like, if someone were to say, "Hey, here's a contract, six months or nine months." We're not paying you any, but we're giving you this brick of gold at the end. Big that brick is, of gold. That is worth the equivalent of what they would pay me on a weekly salary. It's good to have a big brick of gold underneath your bed. <laughs> Noted. Okay, so back in the 1860s, California wasn't that populated, right? Barely a soul here. At least 4,000 people were estimated to have been killed in the floods of California which was roughly 1% of the state population at the time. That's a heavy body count, though. That's a solid 4, 4, body count for the Great Flood of 1862. For a... And this That's 2-9-11. Lasted, lasted, lasted how long? 45 days. 45 days. Yeah. Whoa. 2-9-11s in 
40 days, 45 days. Would you rather... All right, so I'm going to go now to Elian Gonzalez. Elian Gonzalez Brotons is a Cuban technician who, as a child, became embroiled in a heated international custody heated. It was and hot. immigration controversy in 2000 involving the governments of Cuba and the United States. I thought it was earlier than that. I didn't know it was in 2000. I thought it was like 95. No, no. This right is around El Nino. No, this was um, George Bush's first task. First mm. oh, diplomatic yeah. task, I believe. Okay. It this is pre-9-11, right? Pre-9-11. Because I believe it's just earlier in that year. Or, no, I'm well, sorry. 2000. Sorry, I just forgot that. Pre-9-11. It's 2001. Yeah, it's easy math there. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it involved the governments of Cuba and the U.S. His father, Juan Miguel Gonzalez Quintana, his other relatives in Cuba and in Miami, That's and a strong name. Miami's Cuban community. Gonzalez's mother, Elizabeth Brotons Rodriguez, drowned in November 1999 while attempting to leave Cuba with Gonzalez and her boyfriend to get to the U.S. Ileon Gonzalez was five years old when found nestled in an inner tube floating at sea three miles from Florida's Fort Lauderdale coast. Two fishermen found Ileon and reluctantly handed him over to the U.S. Coast Guard. Fort Lauderdale, that's pretty legit. I hope he had fun. (laughs) Well, he was three miles (laughs) off the coast, so probably not. They handed him off to the U.S. Coast Guard as they feared he would be sent back to Cuba under the wet feet, dry feet policy. What is this policy? My guess is if you're in the ocean, you have wet they feet. send you back. You got wet feet. If you right. make it to the U.S., you stick around. But I'll go to the wet feet. Dry I don't feet know if that's true. Policy real quick. I feel like they just keep you a little bit longer and just more paperwork. And then they wet your feet back. Meaning they send you back. The wet feet, dry feet policy or wet foot, dry foot policy was the name given to a former interpretation of the 1995 revision of the application of the Cuban Adjustment Act of 1966 that essentially says that anyone who emigrated from Cuba and entered the U.S. would be allowed to pursue residency a year later. Prior to 1995, the U.S. government allowed all Cubans who reached U.S. territorial waters to remain in the U.S. After talks with the Cuban government, the Clinton administration came to an agreement with Cuba that it would stop admitting people intercepted in U.S. waters. So this is like that scene from Scarface. Do you remember that first opening scene when everybody's coming over from Cuba? Vaguely. That's like the very. That's like that's where Al Pacino, the Cuban, Cuban Al Pacino, yes, the very Cuban man, Al Pacino. <laughs> that's where um, Al uh, Cubano, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Alion Pacino. <laughs> that's that first scene where like there's a bunch of uh, Cubans uh, migrating to the U.S. like in boats and stuff, and yeah. they like, and so they have to again. They don't kick them back out they like just detain them mm. and give them like some sort of like yeah free one year pass and that that law made scarface the coast guard assured them that Ilion would be taken quote unquote ashore for medical reasons deeming him eligible to stay Ilion was immediately taken to a hospital and treated for dehydration and minor cuts on his body it was later found that Ilion's mother elizabeth bro Rodriguez and Lazaro Munero Garcia, her common law husband, had escaped Cuba as part of a group with 14 refugees on a 17 foot boat. That's almost one refugee per foot. Yeah, that's not a big boat. They need a bigger boat. That's what they were saying, I'm sure. However, the others died in a storm while a young couple escaped to the shore and Ileon was found. This is remarkable that he hung on for dear life yeah. when all these adults drowned. Right. But that's the power of kids. They don't like... Yeah, they have kid strength. They don't yeah, care about anybody else except they themselves. bounce back so yeah, easily. Right, right. They're the focus of their own world. They're I just like, to like push them. I push them, just watch them bounce back. All I know in life is that you hang on to boats. Right, or a raft or a floaty. Yeah. That's what kids that kind of grew up on, on floaties all the time. So mm. they know when a floaty's around, grasp for dear life. That is true. Like, adults think they'll be able to swim. Yes, correct. Whereas a kid is like, they, I cannot swim. And that's I how yeah, I am. I don't even want to try. 
So they just hang on. And that was a smart thing to do because then the waves just, you know. They'll take they you wave, somewhere. Wave them over. Wave them over to land. Anyway, they released Ileon to his great uncle, Lazaro Gonzalez, who lived with his family in Miami's Little Havana. These relatives informed the family in uh, Cuba to prepare for an extreme hardship visa waiver. The former were told the next day that some functionary of the government would be coming to get the boy as a result of Fidel Castro's having met with Juan Miguel, Ileon's father. The international tug of war waged between the Cuban and American relatives and state officials can be understood through the agendas of Fidel Castro, the Cuban-American uncle Lazaro Gonzalez representing the Miami relatives and the Miami Cuban expat community and the U.S. government representative, Attorney General Janet Reno. Uh, I think Janet Reno was under Clinton. In the case of Fidel Castro... He sought to showcase his power by first issuing an ultimatum to the U.S. that the boy should be returned to his father within 72 hours or else. Ooh. And then Uba, Bush came Uba. into office and was like, we'll cut the boy in half. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Texas way. <laughs> this boy is too big. <laughs> cut him in half. <laughs> On January 10th, 2000, a Florida state court had ruled that the Florida. So I think Clinton was still wait because this all happened there. Yeah, because this all happened in January. So I didn't know what happened to. Ileana. He gets some. He gets. He got some. He back got some back. Yeah. You didn't know that. I didn't know that after his return. You weren't to tapped into the Latino community. That's the way true. I was, that's a hundred percent true. <laughs> I would hope you are more tapped in than I am. After his return to Cuba, Ileon Gonzalez lived with his father, stepmother, and three brothers in Cardenas, where his father, Juan Miguel, was a waiter at an Italian restaurant in somewhere. Ileon's father was interviewed at the restaurant in 2004 by Keith Morrison. Who's Keith Morrison? He's the guy on Dateline that's like, what about Pam? I'm not familiar now. No, he's always he's always doing these weird, like, oh, but then what happened? He's doing like these murder cases. Okay, okay, interesting. And then he'll say things at the end of like a segment where he's like, "But it can't be that easy." Hmm, it's not ringing a bell, but it does have podcast true crime vibes. He might have also hosted for no, that was Chris Hansen. But I, I feel like Keith Morrison has dabbled in the Catch a Predators. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean he's dabbled? <laughs> Both sides. <laughs> so you interviewed the dad. Uh, did anybody interview wait, wait, Elion? Wait. Like, Listen why not him? Juan Miguel filmed a home video on which Gonzalez was shown doing his arithmetic homework with Juan Miguel in their dining room, going to bed in his bedroom, and his two younger half-brothers, and attending karate lessons. So he's a karate master now? I mean, at the very least, it was good communist propaganda. Right. And he is a karate master now. When it said he's a Cuban technician, yeah. technician of karate. <laughs> like he's technically a kung fu master is what Correct. it's saying. In 2015, Gonzalez was studying to be an industrial engineer and hoped to marry his high school girlfriend and fiance after finishing college. He stated that although he did not regret returning to Cuba, he would like to travel to the United States one day to, quote-unquote, give my love to the American people. Give all my love to the American people. Let the American people drain me dry. Yeah, That's what he's gonna said. He's going to attack us, man. That's, yeah. That's his low-key way of saying, like, America, you're next. In July 2016, he received a degree in industrial engineering from the University of Montezanas and read a letter to Fidel Castro from his graduating class vowing, quote-unquote, to fight from whichever trench the revolution demands. Wow, he's a full-on commie. Man, I wonder what would have happened if he got a bigger taste of America, though. Yeah. And Florida? Right. Florida's like, woo, whatever. <laughs> I'm telling man. I'm telling you, you let that boy loose in Fort Lauderdale, who would never want to go. Give that boy one spring break. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Give him an MTV <laughs> spring break. Mm, he's set for life. Numero uno, numero uno. After graduating in 2016, Gonzalez began working as a technology specialist at a state-run company that makes large plastic water tanks. 
And then, the next year, he cut open one of those water tanks and floated to Fort Lauderdale. Whoa. On the Pineapple Express? That's right. Whoa. On Father's Day in 2020, Gonzalez announced that he and his fiance were expecting a daughter within the following months. Whoa, what happened to getting married soon after college? Right, right. Come on, Ileon, commit! This is what sucks about uh, being a child star the way he was, because the media i don't know that he was <laughs> considered a star <laughs> this child star he got all you know we're lucky he didn't get into drugs but this child star the what sucks about being a child star is that you get followed like your whole life you kind of people like forget about you but then you get that one article one newspaper that yep. hey let's check out what, what are they doing what now are they doing now more clickbait yeah and it's like you know this kid was just a kid he's just living his normal life he's just you know getting fiancéed up and trying to work not at not getting married, not getting married, and then um, what was the other thing? He's a technician of kung fu, of <laughs> of kung fu, yes, a kung fu technician, kung fu and karate. He got his master's in karate. Whoa, undergrad and he, in kung fu. That's pretty. Oh man, I want him to beat my. Ass. Okay, I am going to the wiki article for spank me, if there is one. There's an Etsy website that All right, has I'm, a lot of. I'm going to spanking. Ooh. Since we got to wrap up soon here, and I figured you just mentioned Ilion wanting to get no. spanked or give a spanking. I want him to spank me, but I want to spank Oh, you want to be <laughs> spanked by Ilion. Okay, sorry. I got distracted by the first sentence here. Spanking is a form of corporal punishment. Yeah. Cor what is corporal punishment? That's just like physical punishment? I believe All right, I'm corporate going to cor punishment is the act of... It's a physical punishment. Yeah. Involving How did the you know? I, I guess I thought, it does have a know. weird name. I always thought it came like from a, like a military It thing. sounds more like the government is doing it. I mean, it is. Your parents are the government to you. You know, there's you a know. few certainties in life. Death, taxes, and government spankings. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take one of those, please. <laughs> oh, you got to spit in my mouth first. <laughs> Thank you. May I have another? <laughs> Anyway, it's a form of corporal punishment involving the act of striking with either the palm or the hand or an implement, the buttocks of a person to cause physical pain. The term spanking broadly encompasses the use of either the hand or implement. The use of implements can also refer to the administration of more specific types of corporal punishment, such as caning, paddling, and slippering. All right. We're going to slippering. Sli slippering. That's like, um, it's an old Latin thing with the chancla. It's like a sandal. It's like just oh. getting your slippers out. That's all it is. But okay. I've never heard it called slippering. But it's a term for the act of smacking the buttocks or the hands with a slipper or a slide in the form of corporal or punishment. The, or the back of the neck or the back. Anywhere that anywhere you want to spank them. Yeah. That's my that's my. A lot of shirt. traditionalists think you can only spank on the butt. Not true. I'm not a traditionalist. <laughs> I do the whole bod. <laughs> Full body spanking. I start off low in the toes and go up high in the thighs. Wow. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Do you want to wrap up here with adult yes. spanking or ritual spanking yes, tradition? I literally have two minutes. Yes. Which one? Either or. There's birthday spankings in the U.S., in Europe, on Easter Monday, there is a Slavic tradition of spanking girls and young ladies with woven willow witches and dousing them with water, just like Jesus would have wanted. Can you would save, have wanted? Can you save that article and send it to me? Because I'm celebrating that. This Jesus year. was like, I've risen. Now get to spanking. Now everybody put on white shirts and I'm going to turn this wine into water. <laughs> <laughs> it's Easter, baby. That's what his T-shirt says. Spring break, it's Easter, baby. Oh, it's Easter, baby. Oh, is anybody an Easter baby? Jesus. Easter baby. <laughs> <laughs> ba -ba -da 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 -da. Is that what uh, Marilyn Monroe sang to Bouncing JFK? Bouncing around my basket for you. Beep, beep. <laughs> He's dressed like a bunny. Exactly. Okay. Okay, so we got to wrap it up here. You got a hard out now. Hard out. Super hard. And you guys know me. I'm usually soft. But this is a hard out. Okay, well, we learned something about the Pineapple Express, El Nino, the Great Flood of 1862, Ilion Gonzalez exactly. and his 
Uh, and he's living his... Masters of Karate. His Masters of Karate. And it's nice to hear that someone's living his life the way they want to. I just hope when we check back in with him, what's he up to now? He has his own dojo going. Ooh. Cuban dojo? I'll with him. Okay, so that is the episode. I feel like we learned something. We're starting the year off right here, Jason. Thank you guys for joining us once again. A friendly reminder to like, review, and share this share. podcast with anybody that you love or you hate. Ooh. Yeah, so that should cover all of your bases. Friends and foes. Yeah, frenemies. Uh, and thank you and join us on the next one. Thanks for listening. 